I can speak for Iceland, and I absolutely think the system like it is here today is, has nothing to do with democracy. Uh, it, the, the, the country is controlled by political parties, uh, and they have their own agenda, which has not very much to do with the, with the good of the general public, which democracy, uh, democracy should be about. The way we have done democracy up till now, uh, that system simply doesn't have the legitimacy it had before the crash. After, after the financial collapse of 2008, there was a very strong social uh, upheaval. Uh, there was a very strong feeling that we were somehow at the end of a regime. Instead of responding with anger and uh, uh, going to protests and and making a lot of noise. There were also very many people that were thinking that, you know, we don't need protest or anything to bring this system down. It's collapsing on its own. What we need to think about is what are we going to do next? And I think it's a really good text, but now it's, uh, it's in the hands of the parliamentarians. And it's very important that uh, we will have each other to do one thing, which is very, very, very seriously important. And I'm going to allow myself to be completely sincere, because this is seriously important. The university uh, in Iceland uh, failed. Failed massively. I was in university when everything crashed, studying law, and I was being taught by some teachers how to evade taxation. You know, teaching little lawyers how not to pay tax was happening in our university and the university is paid by taxpayers money there were people that tried to speak out to say listen we're going here in the wrong direction but they were laughed at and they were ridiculed and they were not listened to uh, i think education is somewhat overestimated and it was also in this constitution most of us were very educated uh, I would have preferred to see maybe nurses or taxi drivers or sailors, more of people who are working in the ground, because most of the nation are working on the ground. There is a war between the people who own the world, the people who control the world, and the, the rest of the people, the, the masses, the people that in some cases uh, feel like they have nothing, they have no say in anything. I'm a member of the Parliamentary Assembly to NATO, and in my committee uh, on last session, there was a report on cybercrime, and it was based on WikiLeaks and Anonymous and various other um, threats. After the report was introduced, um, the, the, the person responsible for it uh, said that they had drawn the line where cyber crimes or warfare would be considered um, an act of war, so they could send in the, the real world war up against it. And I asked where is this line and they said we don't want to tell because uh, those that want to uh, use the internet for that sort of purposes will uh, go to the boundaries of this line that we have. The crash, it was not just because of circumstances in the world, it was also because of circumstances here in Iceland. And I would call these circumstances corruption, corruption, corruption. The, the banks have had become bankrupt way before, but they had been collecting money from Holland and uh, Great Britain through these iSave accounts. And uh, when everything collapsed, 
these debts became the debts of the Icelandic public, which is completely unfair. And if we think about it, this whole banking system is incredibly stupid. I don't understand how this can still be going on. I think if Europe would have any sense, they would close down the banks and start all over again and, and say, if, if you're going to borrow a one uh, krona, you have to have it. You cannot just invent it. At the same time, they own the media. So we were in a situation, you know, that we were not being told the truth. Uh, the media was, it was not the thing what they were saying but not what they were not saying, you know. Everything is very hidden. It's very difficult to have real numbers about anything. Uh, it's, it's difficult to have answers about anything. It was difficult when the right-wing government here and everything collapsed. And now with the, with the left-wing government, it's even more difficult. It's the system of having every four years the possibility to vote for different parties that turn out all to be more or less the same when they get into power. It's just totally not working. Example, we are having people here in a, uh, standing in a food line. Why are we having that? And the finance minister, he was talking about almost 15,000 millions Icelandic crowns and put it into one uh, small bank in Keflavik. The bank was bankrupt. Why didn't the finance minister just let this bank be a private owned bank? Just land bankrupt? Why was he taking 15,000 millions from the people and put into this bank? And having these people standing in food line? It's corruption. During the protests, you know, people were, were generally very negative towards IMF. But now IMF is doing what? What they led to at the government that was voted uh, for being against IMF, and they are, they are, they are doing what uh, what they want them to do. A stand in Brunei, where a former leader of this unshakable team of mothers. You always start with yourself. It sounds very egocentric, but it's not. Because I believe I'm fighting for a better life for myself. And if I start doing that, all the other people who would also want to do it, they come. Politics. Politics, there are like when system it's the same system for decades. It means there are the same power people, same power groups, families, and they don't want to change the situation. I'm not saying all political parties are evil or bad, but I think what they do is they uh, they give for, uh, they give people the the chance to not think. You know, you just think, okay, I will put my ex here with this uh, uh, hurt people and trust them. And it's not a great idea because we have to think by ourselves, you know. And if you just decide to outsource your participation in uh, society and democracy to other people, uh, you are uh, betraying your society, I think. You know, so I think they become little mafias, unfortunately, and they start just thinking about how they can maintain themselves and how they can maintain more power and how they can get their people into the right places and stuff like that. Since the crash in 2008, uh, up to about 50% of the voters uh, would like to vote uh, some other party which is which they haven't seen, just anything else that, other than the old political parties or they would turn in an empty vote or wouldn't want to vote. The parliament has had, uh, with, uh, they haven't even reached 10% trust. About 9% of Iceland trust the parliament. Uh, in a recent poll uh, the majority of Icelanders thought, Icelanders thought that uh, the elected officials in Parliament were looking more after the interests of the banks than the homes or, or, the, or, or citizens in general. We, we are not good enough uh, consumers and that has to do with uh, general consuming and also democratic consuming. 
uh, uh, people tend to forget very quickly what uh, what the political parties are about and what they have done in the past. They're sticking with them like uh, like uh, uh, football teams, like fans of football clubs, and that's really something that we have to learn not to do. I've seen lots of good people with good intentions going into a political party and because they have this really, really good thing they want to work on and in a couple of years they are suddenly agreeing to all sorts of really stupid things because they have realized that that's the only way that they can get their good thing across in that party. I would never ever ever go into politics because I don't want my soul to become corrupted and evil. I, I, I mean, I was willing to do this constitution because it was a limited time, uh, only four months, and I believe that I could go in and out and still be a relatively normal person. What democracy does is try to distribute the power as much as possible, to try to let each individual carry as little power as possible, so they will come as little corrupted as possible. Example, if you have about 10 kids on the age from 6 to 8 years old and you put them into the room and you put some chocolate cake on the table and uh, you say to the kids you have to leave the cake alone but I have to go outside of the room for a half hour what's happened? But if you would sit in there with the kids and say, you don't, you're not allowed to eat the cake, leave it alone, and what's going to happen? The kids are going to leave the cake. They are not going to eat it because you are in there. Say if there was a illness, a cancer, and you could decide if you would give the cancer to one person and they would probably die, or you would distribute it to 100 people and they would just be a little injured, you know, and they would not die. It would be much better to do that, to distribute it to more people and uh, to let them suffer less. So I think it's similar with power. It's like if people would stop looking at power as something like really good and, and, and something that they want and start looking at this like a disease or something they don't want, I think the, the, uh, it would be much more interesting and much more normal uh, sort of uh, chemistry towards it, you know. But it's being mixed up with greed. It's the worst combination ever. If people want to, we can have financial crisis every 50 years and go to hell and come back and go to hell and come back. You know, each generation can suffer the same pain if they want to, or we could decide that we don't want to and change something. But then it has to be fundamental change and philosophical. It's not enough to just say, okay, new people in the same game. No. Uh, the citizens' movement was a project uh, that was brought together by uh, many groups in the grassroots that that were had been like very dissatisfied since the collapse, and they got together. And those groups that felt it right that we should start an official party, uh, register it, and go all the way to elections. Those groups became then the citizens' movement. And uh, it was officially started, uh, I think, in the uh, end of March 2009, with our collapse in October 2008. Uh, and those groups had been discussing and discussing and discussing for a very long time, trying to find what are our mutual focuses, our mutual policies, our mutual goals, our mutual vision, what, what unites us. We had to think very quickly. We were all, you know, saying no in the beginning, never. Never go to politics, and uh, no, we n nobody wants to be an MP in Iceland. We wanted to change things, not be a part of them. I think the society, in a way, pushed us into to make something for them, which was the civic movement. But afterwards, I think uh, we had too little time because we worked very effectively in the civic movement when we started to the election, but after the election there was no plan B. What are we going to do if we get elected? In the beginning we didn't, we didn't want this pyramid model for the party. This wasn't a party, it was a movement. So we wanted to all be equal. So it was no leader. We didn't want one leader to lead us.
because we want it all to be leaders. We came from everywhere. We had people who were left, left parties and right parties and middle parties and anarchists all together. And the people could run if they want to run. We had like 16 names on a list. We wanted to man, woman, man, man, woman. We want people to be equal to run. And um, if two people want to be number one on a the list, they have to throw something, you know, a coin. Which, which one of you are going to be in the first? And then we had a woman after him, and then, you know. And it was easy. Good day, and welcome to this Loka Nick and Kostninga Vöku here in the show. Borgarahreiningin fekk 7,2% og fjóra þingmenn. Frjálslindi flokkurinn fekk 2,2% og tapaði þeim fjórun sem hann fekk kjörna árið 2007. Sjálfstæði flokkurinn fekk 23,7%, 16 þingmenn tapaði 9. Framsögna flokkurinn fekk 14,8%, 9 þingmenn vann 2. The mutual uh, policy that, that, that uh, the citizens movement formed around was, like I said, threefold. It was uh, to uh, uh, make sure that those responsible for the economic collapse were held responsible. So, court cases, etc., etc. Number two, helping the, the homes of, of this country by being, being, doing it fairly, doing it in such a way that when the government, for example, knew that things were going wrong, that the banks knew that things were going wrong, we know this, and this is on record, that the loans that had been like mutated, but it grew by leaps and bounds because of the collapse, that that would be corrected back, for example. Third was to make sure that this doesn't happen again, then that would be, that we would have a new constitution and changes of the law. Now the trick that has made it possible for us to be activists still inside the parliament and never forget our mission is there are three very important uh, elements. One is that uh, in the agenda, uh, uh, in the agreement we did with the nation, uh, we promised we would only exist for eight years max. And every time we have a meeting, a general meeting with people that are part of the movement, we have to ask if it's time to dissolve. Because if it's obvious that we are not achieving anything, or if we finish our checklist, we have to dissolve. We don't have leaders, and that's very important. Uh, so we rotate re uh, responsibilities, and it leaves us, uh, makes us free from the prima donnas uh, that feel that they are the most important people. We are all equally important. The third ingredient is that nobody that has been involved in politics, be it a parliamentarian or uh, in the youth movement, uh, were allowed to run. We were all amateurs, and I think that was the good thing about us, that we were not politicians, and we, we are still not considering ourselves like politicians. And according to the constitution of Iceland, you should follow a uh, parliamentary, you should just follow its own uh, confidence, that is the only uh, claim that is put on a parliamentary. Uh, some of the, the people in the civic movement said, well, no, we don't agree on that. We want to uh, be been asked how the, uh, we want to be in control of the parliamentarians and so the parliamentarians cannot uh, vote on what they, how they want to do. It was inevitable that the movement split or the parliamentarians split from the, the civic movement because uh, it was established in such a rush and there were so many uh, points that were not discussed beforehand on how we were going to work. Yeah.
trúnaðvinni. Vil ég bjarta framtíð með besta flóknum eða vil ég hortí með reykjavík? Best! Ókefis handklæði á öllum sundstöðum. Best, best í flóknum. Ísbjörn í húsdýragarðin. Best í reykjavík. Alls konar fyrir rauminga. Hvert er þessi nýr? Disneyland í vassmýri. Uh, we had uh, some elections in the municipalities and everywhere there were new parties forming and running and they always came everywhere when they were uh, the new people got into the uh, city councils or town councils. Well the best party was a relatively new uh, idea when the founder and uh, our current mayor Jörg Gnar uh, sent me a message on Facebook and asked me if I wanted to join. And I said, sure, what do I have to do? And he said, nothing, it's just going to be fun. Uh, most of the people in the best party are artists uh, and uh, worked as such before we got elected. I can say that uh, every single one, uh, single person of the best party is uh, a very common, uh, regular person. Uh, none of us had any political background, so everything was new to us. About a month after the election, I realized what had happened. Uh, we kind of took the city and ourselves, I think, by storm. Alta, the Association for Democracy, was born um, out of a frustration. There were a group of people, myself included, who were frustrated with that the new government, which took over after the crisis in 2008, weren't make, making any changes to the system. They were, they were following the IMF, they were re uh, you could say that they were readjusting and, and reconstructing and, and re-establishing the same system that was before. Uh, a lot of people hoped that they would change the system both economically and, and politically and allow for more democratic uh, participation and, and direct democracy. But we weren't seeing any changes. So a group of people came together and started a, a, the association to find ideas of how we can make our society more democratic, not ideologically but in practice. We, we needed to find real examples out in the world which have been tried and tested. One of the uh, clear demands of the pots and pan revolution in 2009 was that there should be a constitutional assembly. One of the first things that we did in Alta was to create a group that would make uh, special proposals for the constitutional assembly or constitutional council. One of the examples was that uh, we thought that uh, a part of the elected representatives in parliament should be selected randomly from the, from the general public. Uh, and we based it on a, an experiment in, in British Columbia and Ca Canada where they selected 160 people uh, randomly from the general public to create and, and, and put forth a new election law. Randomly selected representatives are more likely to um, look to the general public, look for the greater good. They are not uh, as likely to be trying to look for special interests or, or working for other groups or, or corporations. They're simply part of the general public. I think people are very much aware of that there are some things definitely wrong about the economic system and the political system. The problem is, and what we need to do, to change it, uh, change the situation and get people more integrated into the discussion about societal uh, issues is that we need to
create uh, decision making processes, we need to create forums, we need to create channels for people to uh, get their ideas into the system. A real democracy is not about having a referendum every month or, or ongoing where you just look at something and say yes and no. Uh, if we would go only by that, then we would have a really dangerous system. Because then we would have something that the people would not be bothered to check out the facts, to check out the best points for and against. People would just go and say yes, no, because they saw on the television or they saw in the newspaper that that was the way to go. We are the uh, Citizen Foundation in Iceland. It's a non-profit organization which has its uh, main objective to uh, connect the people with the people in power, to make the people in power listen to the uh, normal people, the, uh, the, uh, the normal citizen. Before the last uh, municipal election in Reykjavik, we started a new website called Better Reykjavik. That was a success. What happened there was that we got more people participating and we also had a new political party that felt that a system like this was really something that would help them in deciding what would be their main issues if and when they got into power. One thing that is probably really important is that we were addressing issues that were much closer to people, not the big governmental issues which people have been told they can't understand because it's so complicated, and also people have been told indirectly is that you don't have anything to say in that except every four years. We're talking about the wisdom of the crowd. We're talking about that if you have many people addressing a problem and if you have the infrastructure, if you have a system for doing that properly, then no one person can know better than that crowd. We need to have a system where people are actively participating in the decision-making and not only decision-making, but also in finding out beforehand what are the main issues. What is the thing that matters most to you, you yourself and therefore to the society as a whole. We need to find out from the arguments, is this the correct priority and if so, how can we, from this, those best arguments, how can we do a working plan? How can we make a plan how to implement this? How to, uh, to uh, change it from a simple idea plus arguments into a working plan which preferably everybody can agree on, but practically speaking, hopefully 80, 90% of the people can agree on this is the way we want to go. The constitution that we have now in Iceland is a Danish constitution, an old Danish constitution that was given to us uh, when, uh, when uh, we, uh, we uh, got our independence. And, uh, and uh, it was always supposed to be a temporary constitution for us. The basic idea about the constitutional society is that uh, the people should write their own constitution, not the ruling government. This field was dominated by uh, the politicians and the academics. We decided very quickly that we were not going to take any stand. Uh, we, we're not we were not going to uh, say that this, uh, this amendment is right or this is wrong or anything. We just wanted to people to start talking about it. And that, that was, a, I think, a really wise decision. We had always the threat of doing this ourselves. But the roots of this is that the ruling power has never wanted to change the constitution. So they, they, 
they really needed a little a little push in the right direction and we tried to be a very uh, polite but very pushing in all our, uh, our all our methods if the Icelandic uh, general public would write a constitution by itself who is a government to say that that is not the right constitution people were really given the possibility of per participating in all this process. All of a sudden thousands of comments started pouring in uh, and the, the good thing about this is of course not, uh, not only that that the, the, the general public showed interest but that the committee really really listened to what, what came in there and, uh, and answered all the comments and uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was quite a pleasure to follow. What we did in the Constitution uh, Council, we decided with 25 people with totally different backgrounds and uh, very different views, we were going to find the solution we could all live with. We were not going to find the solution most people wanted and just like w run over the mi minority. So we talked and talked and talked and talked and we talked to each other with respect. We weren't trying to find out, ah, but you are contradicting yourself because before you said this, blah, 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 always attacking, attacking, attacking. We said no to that because this is warfare politics and this doesn't, like if you want a peaceful society you have to be the chains and you have to work in peaceful matters and you have to find a way to uh, approach every project with such respect that you're not going down to the level you're trying to eliminate. It was really difficult in the beginning because we had like a, our ideas and we felt oh they're so imperfect how can we put them online that people are going to say what are we doing but it was completely the opposite and we learned that you can trust the people and all of a sudden there were like thousands of people writing the constitution together which was very beautiful. I was in the area of human rights and natural resources and uh, rights of the nature and environmental protection. And that's uh, three of my, my well, two of my at least uh, biggest uh, hobbies and, and interest, which I love, is human rights and uh, uh, protection of nature. And we're taking a, a really radical stance towards the protection of nature because in Iceland, uh, I don't know if you know, but there's a very beautiful nature and it's been uh, under the attack of big American aluminum companies which want all our energy and instead we have to sacrifice unbelievable highlands and uh, you know it's very it's a it's a horrible story i think we uh, built on the bolivian and the ecuadorian uh, constitutions which are really radical in the way that they protect the rights of nature for nature itself not how can man use nature but why should nature be a party that should be protected without any you know, uh, consideration into how we can benefit from it. So we wrote that in and we said nature has a special right. It's the foundation of all life. And, uh... The second group were mostly, were mostly talking about the system itself. Uh, that's the parliament and the ministers and uh, the judges. They have been trying to increase the force of the parliament and try to do the parliament more independent from the ministers and from the judges. The third group, which I was a part in, it was about how to vote and uh, democracy and uh, foreign affairs. Uh, our most important task was how to vote. And uh, in Iceland we have political parties but the voter, he, he has uh, nearly nothing to say about who he will vote in the party. The party just uh, hands us a menu and you have to take it all or nothing. And that was the main thing we would change, that the voters could uh, pick up what, they, what meals they like best. Uh, and uh, we will always see how we could pick a meal between menus that will say you could vote for one party or more parties and also choose between candidates uh, in, uh, in different parties. The idea that we are putting forward in the new constitution uh, is that 10% of the people can say no to any law from the parliament, 10% of the voters. And then uh, it has to go into na 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 uh, national referendum so everyone gets to vote about it. And secondly, 
uh, or thirdly, uh, two percent of the people can present a certain issue on the par in the parliament. So if you get two percent of the voters to say we want to talk about uh, animal rights, the parliament will have to uh, take that matter. So we're really trying to put the power back into the hands of the people where it belongs. The biggest problem of our work is that we are a little bit stuck in the Montesquieu thinking that the power is three. It's like the legislation, the judges and the, and the government. So what I and more other people were saying is that we need to think about the power of wealth. How the power of wealth can influence the other uh, governmental powers. For example, it can influence the uh, people through the media. And so what we've done is we tried to figure out where the power lies with the power of wealth and with other official powers. So we put in an article saying that uh, political parties could not accept more money than X, you know, and they should always put the, their uh, their books open so you could know who is, uh, you know, who is uh, giving money to whom. Also with the media, the ownership of the media will have to be transparent and will have to be independent so that wealthy people cannot own the media secretly and brainwash the public like has happened before. The most difficult, difficult task to get one solution in was the researchers and the owner rights. For about 30 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, the fisheries, the right to fish here around Iceland, was given to only a few. And uh, this has been sold and sold again. Uh, they who bought it, they of course don't want to hand it to, to the state. Most people are seeing better and better that if we just let all our resources be in uh, private ownership, we lose them. At the end, we lose them and we never see them again. We did not focus so much on the crash or the money problem itself. We focused more on why, why it did occur. If you want freedom, you have to take the responsibility with it. But in Iceland, there were freedom without responsibility. If you, if you earned money, you, you put it in your own pocket. But if you lost money, you said, I'm sorry, I can't pay, and the taxpayer has to pay it. And I think that's what you are trying to say no to. No thank you for this system. There is three possibilities now. One is that the, uh, the new constitution will go to the people to vote on. Uh, I think this option is unlikely. Uh, number two is that the uh, parliament uh, may do a, a, their own constitution and then both of them will go to a referendum. Maybe that will happen. And the third uh, option is that nothing happens. In fact, many, many uh, senators in Iceland, they see this new constitution as their uh, resignation paper. And that's why they will always be against it. Political parties cannot decide to reduce the power of political parties. You can hear it's like physically impossible. So what's going to happen is that they're going to try. But I believe that the, if the our ideas are good enough, they will conquer. That's the way things go. You know, if if this is a better constitution, the people of Iceland will demand it, and if they demand it, they will get it. That's the that's the new lesson we've learned. We've been waiting for this for almost 70 years, and every fourth year in new election they promise a new constitution, and then after the election, they're like, ah, we don't have no enough time or money or some explanations about there's not going to be a new constitution. So we go to election again, and then they promise again. And this has been like this for almost 70 years. But now they have no way out. I can promise you that. There's no way out for them to let the people down.
what we've seen in the last decades is that we've moved a lot of the decisions that were made in the political field out into the economic field. We've uh, privatized industry, we've privatized uh, public services, we've privatized a lot of things that before were uh, under the political field, un uh, where decisions were made by political representatives, uh, which are now the decisions are made by those who govern or, or rule in the economic field. We expect the economy to grow every year and the main issue of every economy is growth, that we need to grow. But infinite growth in a finite world is simply impossible. Uh, on current levels, the Western world is consuming many times the possibility for the Earth, our planet and our resources to, to produce. We are, consuming at a level that's unsustainable. There is no power stronger in modern society than the power to create and issue money. Then we must consider um, who it is, which entities are creating the money and not only creating the money, uh, but issuing the money and allocating the money, deciding who gets a loan and at which, which interest rates. What we would like to see is that um, we would like to, for this uh, tremendous power, to be taken out of the hands of the bankers, to be brought back into the hands of government. What happens when all this new money gets created uh, to cover the interest payments? This is actually what we call inflation. It is the inflation of the money supply. Basic fact is, in Iceland, only 2% of the money supply is actually created and issued by the central bank, which is run by the government. The remaining part and the largest part of the money supply is bank credit, which is created when a bank issues a loan. Credit is created in the system, basically out of thin air. The top priority is uh, the separation of uh, investment banking and commercial banking. It's one thing when you have small deposits, which are uh, ordinary people's savings that they may need to access to, uh, uh, to buy food and, and uh, other necessities in, in hard times. Uh, but another thing is when you have certain extremely wealthy individuals, many of them who have uh, become wealthy from financial operations themselves. Why should these deposits be covered in full at the expense of others that are perhaps not as well off. Another thing is that uh, in order to provide this refinancing for the, for the new banking system, the Icelandic uh, government uh, had no other option than to uh, take on huge external debts. These debts can only be uh, paid from taxes, from future taxes that will be eventually paid by myself, others like me, and perhaps by my children, and even by their children. We really don't know today how long into the future it will take to repay all those debts.
of very uh, very strong points that have uh, come through in our discussions in our group is is that uh, to have uh, a better and healthier uh, economic system that really serves the public needs and not private interests. Uh, it's probably best if everyone has ac access to information about almost everything. So why should there be secrets about an entity that is not a person? There's nothing personal about the business. It's just business, right? So why should there be any confidentiality? Wouldn't it be better if everything was out in the open? Fact is, the Icelandic media doesn't talk about this. And I'm saying to people, this is no surprise to me. The Icelandic media does not talk about what's important for us people. They talk about what's important for them as owners, as greedy people. People who are power hungry, people who are running after money. They don't care about this. They want to silence this. You know, they are not only taking the property from, from us, they are not only privatizing the banks, etc., you know, making it all this financial uh, religion, but they are also taking the language. The politicians, the financial people, the lawyers, they were speaking a kind of, speaking a kind of a specific language. And they were, they were, they were ruling us with the language. The freedom of information is gradually being chipped away from us and we don't really know because it's done in such a way. I mean, like in the UK, you have uh, super injunctions, you have out-of-court settlements, uh, and the out-of-court settlements means that the news will never be told about, for example, unethical criminal behavior of the big corporations, and of course the corrupt politicians and the ties between these two entities. And the super injunctions means that if you as a journalist are placed under super injunction, you cannot tell that you can't tell the story, which is super censorship. Nú rétt fyrir fréttir nálguðust fjölmennar sveitur uppreistarmanna borgina óflug. Orustan um Tripoli er hafin eftir hraða framsókt lípískra uppreistarmanna sem náði dag herstöðnar. So we need a more intervention from the academic society in Iceland. We need more time uh, for journalists in Iceland to dig deeply down into uh, what's going on in the economic situation and, and feed the, the general public with, with better information than they do now. It should be using the people. It should be like making, asking people to do like uh, video blogs and, and showing them online and connecting to the technology and really, and why shouldn't the people of Iceland who pay for all this, why shouldn't they be on some sort of a committee deciding what should be on television? Why is it just some uh, random politically appointed people who choose that? I mean, sometimes at night after night, this is such shit. American soap operas and, uh, you know, really bad stuff. You're not going to change the world unless you change the way you do stuff. You know, you as an individual, you have that responsibility. If you know about the crimes of Coca-Cola, um, you can't possibly allow yourself to buy Coca-Cola. Uh, many people say, oh, we can't stop uh, using Amazon or PayPal or Visa or whatever, because then we can't do things as we used to. Well, I've got news for you. We're not going to be able to live in a world the way we used to because there's not going to be any planet left for the next generations. We're all going to have to do our part in changing our ways. Well, it may start with this event. Um, exactly this event. 
uh, and it's a uh, uh, Reykjavik D Digital Freedoms Conference and it was held at the University of Reykjavik on the 1st of December 2009. And uh, I was invited to speak there um, and uh, Julian Assange and Daniel at the time called Smith, now Don Seidberg, were speaking on behalf of WikiLeaks. And they were discussing this idea that had actually been re uh, presented a year earlier by John Perry Barlow, the founder of the Electronic uh, uh, Foundation in the US, about taking the model of the tax haven, where, you know, if I want to start a tax haven tomorrow, I would pull together all the best laws in the world in order to create secrecy. Now, the idea that John Perry Barlow first uh, provided here in Iceland was to create um, sort of Switzerland of bytes, where you could uh, provide safe haven for freedom of information. We wanted to change or write or improve, upgrade 10 different laws in four different ministries. And uh, so it would it would have been impossible because of the system we have and traditions for parliamentary laws not to be passed uh, or laws that are written by parliamentarians and particularly from the smallest movements or parties. So we decided in collaboration with the um, staff here in the parliament uh, to create a proposal tasking the government to, to do this task of changing 10 different laws um, or writing. For example, we don't have any proper whistleblowing legislation, which is critical for a small country like this. And to my amazement, I uh, somehow managed to get um, the entire parliament to agree to do this, uh, including the government, the, the prime minister, and um, all the ministers that were present during this voting. I really call upon people uh, to look at laws, not only information laws, but laws in general, uh, and find to use the method and the uh, the way of the hacker. Okay, so like the hackers, they look at systems uh, online uh, and they look for the weaknesses in the system. And sometimes they, by exposing it, um, you know, sometimes in a very colorful way, uh, they show the weakness, and then the companies responsible for the weakness can improve that or they, the hackers themselves, improve them. The good benefit of working with Wikileaks at this time was that they had managed to evade uh, both the lawyers from around the world that had threatened uh, them and taken them to court. They had won all the court cases and they've always managed to keep the information online no matter what. So they had the hands-on experience uh, where the countries are actually functioning, where they're not just nice letters on a piece of paper. In open courtyard. Yeah, Roger. I just estimated there's about 20 of them. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know if that's a weapon. Copy white six. That's a weapon. Yeah. By doing what we're doing with EMEA, it's not about making Iceland necessarily the best country in the world, but to set the standard. Because from my experience, I've been traveling all over the world to speak about freedom of information because of EMEA and of course uh, because of my work with Wikileaks. I was one of the um, core volunteers during the times of the collateral murder video and, and I co-produced that. Um, I feel that there is just so much need that we stay on top of things and that we uh, make sure that we have these pillars of democracy. If you don't have freedom of information, expression and speech, you are not living in a democracy. Keep shooting. Keep shooting. For the time being, we do not have any civic rights with our information online, uh, yet so much of our very personal information is now stored, uh, and particularly in hostile countries like the US.
those who control the society, they are very well organized. They have IMF, they have the World Bank, they have the European Union, they have NATO, OECD, everything, you know, this is like the, the cl clubs of the ruling class, you know. But when, you, when it comes to the people, the common people in Iceland and Portugal and Ireland and England or wherever we are, you know, we are very badly organized. If, if we keep on with the system as it has been for the last years, then what we're going to be seeing is we're going to be seeing blood on the street. We're going to be seeing people killed. We're going to see real civil war. And I think that the people in power realize this, but they're still not, they definitely don't want to let go of any of their power. There's only one thing that will scare the people who are in power enough to uh, let them think they don't want to be in power anymore. And that's the threat of revolution, I'm sorry. But that's the only thing that worked here. It's like saying, okay, if you don't obey us, we are your employees. We are, we are, no, we are the one that pay your, you, you, your salaries. You are there as our servant. If you don't understand when we want you to leave or when we want you to do certain things, you will have to go. And if you don't want to go, we will carry you out. Simple. But that's the way it is. The idea of a single person holding great powers in a democratic state is is, um, is outdated. It's out. It's uh, it's obsolete. Um, we need to move the decisions to the general public and take powers from offices of single persons or a few persons. What we decided was that we are not going to try to present some one silver bullet as a solution. But we would rather try to bring out many different ideas. Different ideas from what we had before. It can be done. We have shown that it can be done. You can start with your two empty hands and just with a lot of force and, and people who are willing to volunteer. Uh, it is it is doable. You can do it in, in Portugal. You can do it in Rome. You can do it in, in Greece and you know, and everywhere. We need to be thinking like what sort of society we want to be in like 50 years and in uh, 100 years. Not just like okay, how can we put out the biggest fires now? But you know, t we need some sort of a awakening. It's very important that we also downgrade and downsize, not downgrade, that we downsize the system. Um, because both the corporations have become big and the systems, uh, and it's become very difficult for people to influence their immediate uh, sort of personal life. If people will feel an impact of what they do uh, directly, that will inspire them to be more um, responsible civilians uh, and participate in co-creating their own realities. Those who think that the economy doesn't have to abide by the rules of democracy need to tell us why. Because we call ourselves democratic states, but most of the time in work, in our workplaces, uh, we are not part of a democracy, but simply part of a system where a few people have most of the power and, and make all the decisions. Many of us believe that uh, at this point in history it is actually possible to bring on uh, new ideas, new things and reform without having to first get rid of the old things because what's what has happened is that the old way of doing things has mostly taken care of itself and it is no more i mean some of the left-wing 
parties are doing more right-wing decisions in some areas than the right-wing parties. And, and this is just the distraction. And the right-wing parties are doing the same. I mean, they're, they're building huge systems. That is absolutely not right-wing from my cookbook. So maybe uh, practical anarchism is uh, the order of the day, where you at least provide the people with the tools and the inspiration to participate in their own societies and to understand that the society is them. It's not an external force, it's us. Fighting for change is fun. It is fun, you know, when you when you meet up in a small room and maybe the roof is leaking and, and you're just trying to discuss your, your brain brainstorming about how you can do something without having anything to make something change. It's the most beautiful moments of life. So I don't understand when people say they don't are not interested in politics or in, in, in making a change. It's the it's most fun thing you can do. I was always thinking about my kids and my grandkids. Do I want to leave this to them and tell them just to, you know, have no future, just pay the bank's debts and, you know, and just to realize this is life? No, this is not life, not for me. You can always hope for a better future. That's my message. Freedom has the face of a human being. It's not a woman. Black hood, that's not freedom. Freedom has the face of a human being, right? Very clear to me, and a smiling one.